This is a horror podcast, and as a result, it will have some horror in it. You may find that horror too disturbing. Don't worry, this ride is one you can get off at any time. Just press stop if it's getting to you. The fun rama at Old Man Jenkins' World of Fun and Death, that's not a ride you can get off, and honestly not one we would recommend you get on. Pseudopod, Artemis Rising 4, Episode 588, from March 30th, 2018. The Good Mother's Home for Wayward Girls by Izzy Wasserstein. I'm Sarah Gailey, a human being made of bones that are covered in meat and captained by a ghost. It is my pleasure to serve as your host this week. Izzy Wasserstein teaches writing and literature at a Midwestern university and writes poetry and fiction. Her work has appeared in Glittership, Prairie Schooner, Crab Orchard Review, and elsewhere. She shares a home with her spouse and their animal companions. She's a graduate of Clarion West and likes to slowly run long distances. The Good Mother's Home for Wayward Girls is a pseudopod original. Your narrator this week is Tatiana Gray. Tatiana is a New York City-based actress of stage, screen, and of course, the audio booth. She is equally at home, speaking heightened language in a corset, in a leather jacket, spouting obscenities, and as a dancer. This depth and facility with multiple genres garnered her a New York Innovative Theatre Award Best Featured Actress nomination for her work in The Night of Nosferatu. Her facility with accents has landed her quite a few audiobooks and numerous on-camera roles, including the role of Evgenia in the award-winning I Am a Fat Cat. Now, we have a story for you, and we promise you, it's true. The Good Mother's Home for Wayward Girls by Izzy Wasserstein Narrated by Tatiana Gray One of the mothers shoves the new girl into the dorm room. The slick threads of the mother's grasp lingering long enough that several of us shiver. The new girl wears a short dress shot through with sunset, though we are not sure we remember sunsets properly. The hem of the dress is ragged and mud-caked. It's the most beautiful thing we have ever seen. We hate the new girl. Get her into uniform, the mother commands. It makes no sound, but its words echo between our ears. The new girl has been standing with her hands on opposite shoulders, her chin jutting forward. That changes when we surround her. We rip the dress from her shoulders and toss a gray shift over her body. Now she is dressed just as we are. The mother squelches out of the room, and the door slams shut behind it. The new girl is skinny, Kate says. Kate hates the new girl more than the rest of us, and is far more relieved that she has arrived. Too skinny, Miranda agrees. You think you're pretty, new girl? Miranda has been at the good mother's home the longest of any of us. She has not been the new girl in a very long time. But she is not inclined to mercy. My name is Belle. The new girl says. No one cares, new girl. Kate shoves her. The new girl stumbles back, then raises her fists. There is something in her we recognize. Not all new girls have it. Kate, who was the new girl for a long time, did not have it. Kate is caught now, picking a fight with someone who will not cower like she once did. Say that again, the new girl demands. Kate hesitates. The great clock in the hallway strikes night. A mother outside the door forces a word in our heads. Bed. We scramble into our bunks. The gas lamps flicker and die. The new girl does not move. Bed. The voice in our heads is louder the second time. It feels like a rat scratching behind our eyes. Get in bed, new girl, we shout. Jack cracks her knuckles. 
the new girl gets into bed, and the mother's pressure in our mind fades. Kate says, If you get us in trouble, new girl, you'll pay. We will make you pay. Kate has scars down her back that were not there when she arrived. When she thinks the rest of us are asleep, Molly tips over to the new girl's bed. Welcome to the home, new girl, she says. The new girl does not respond. We fall asleep wondering if we hear scratching and scraping noises outside. In the morning, that is, when the gas lamps ignite, the new girl's dress, which we left on the floor, is gone. We shuffle down to the bathroom. No one bothers to tell the new girl what is happening. She doesn't ask. Kate hangs back and stage whispers, You're not going to survive, new girl. The mothers will punish you or you'll slit your wrists. Kate is brave because there are mothers watching us. One in the doorway to the kitchen, one clinging to the ceiling, leaving a puddle of ichor on the moldy tile of the hall. We will need to clean up that mess later. No, we will make the new girl do it. A mother oversees us in the bathroom, its undulating form sliding like a misplaced shadow out of the corner. We do not understand the mothers, but we know some of the things they hate, like fights and uncleanliness. This means Kate cannot hurt the new girl the way she would like. We can feel the ache coming off her like heat from the ruin of her back. But she can still use words. Skinny, she says. Look at those ribs. We join in because we hate the new girl. The new girl does not cry, though her face reddens. We remember that she did not scream when the mother touched her. We leave the bathroom. The great clock reads, Day. But the light that spills in from the windows high above us does not look like what we remember of daylight. We doubt Miranda remembers daylight at all. Now we mark time like this. When the clock strikes night, we hide in our door room until day returns and the lamps ignite. Some of us remember a girl who snuck out at night. We cannot forget her screams. We eat breakfast at the long table in the dining hall. The porridge is slightly bitter, which Jack prefers to bland, but Molly wretches at the taste. When the new girl goes to take a bite, Kate knocks her bowl away. There are no mothers watching, no one to punish her. The new girl stands up. She's shorter than Kate and lighter, but even Jack tenses. Kate's eyes widen but she does not stand. Let's settle this, the new girl says. We don't know where the fierceness in her comes from. Were we ever like that, we wonder? And then hate her more for making us ask. Kate looks down at the chipped tabletop. The new girl grabs her porridge and sits down. After breakfast, we do our chores. Chores build character the mothers remind us often. We will refine you. We scrub floors that never come clean. Whitewash peeling wallpaper, prune the gray-leafed trees in the enclosed garden. Over time, we have cleaned the whole of the home, the dorm room, the dining hall, the kitchen, the bathroom. There is so much to clean. Miranda thinks there used to be many more wayward girls, because there are so many empty bunks, so much empty space. But we cannot be sure. You're cleaning up after the mothers, new girl, Miranda says. I am not, says the new girl. She plants her feet and crosses her arms. Do it, Kate says, or we'll hurt you. Shut up, Kate, Miranda says. New girl, clean it or we'll make sure it costs you. Show her your back, Kate. Kate cringes, her shoulders hunch. 
I don't want to, she says. Do it now, Miranda says. Kate's gaze is a well of bitterness. She turns and lifts the rough fabric over her head. The new girl looks. The mothers will do worse than that, Molly says. She was not the new girl for long and still has some sympathy left. The new girl stands very still. Then she grabs a pail and sets to work. On her second night, the new girl takes a piece of broken glass and makes two scratches on the wall above her head. We loudly take bets on how long she'll keep that up. That night, we are almost sure we hear a snuffling outside the walls of the home. The new girl has made many, many scratches by the morning of the fight. Kate has stopped trying to fight the new girl because Kate is a coward. That is why we hated her for so long, we tell ourselves. Only Molly doesn't hate Kate because Kate became the new girl so soon after Molly. Kate does not want to fight the new girl, but she wants her to bleed. The new girl talks about feeling the wind blow across her arms and about the tang of sourdough between her lips. She talks about the smell of the sea the feeling of gravel between her toes. Kate hates her and grows clever in her desire to hurt. She waits for Jack to have a bad day. And Jack does, when a mother spreads its i all over the garden and makes Jack clean it. We never know why the mothers do what they do. Miranda told us that once, long ago, a girl asked, and a mother said, for your protection, sweet thing, and wrapped its appendages around the girl. After that, the girl didn't ask any more questions. She just stood, slack-mouthed, drooling. This time, the mother makes Jack clean the garden for so long she's late for dinner, rushing to fill her plate before it is too late, before we're shepherded to the dorm, before the clock strikes night. Kate waits until Jack is walking to the table with her tray, then shoves the new girl backward off the bench and into Jack. The porridge spills everywhere. The new girl struggles to her feet and turns to Kate, eyes burning with hate. But Jack stands almost as fast, and she tackles the new girl. They scramble onto the floor. The new girl is clever and vicious. She jabs her thumbs at Jack's eyes, bites and claws. But Jack is much stronger and thinks she used to be a fighter before the mothers took her in. And she's covered in i -Corps. Jack has so much rage, it's frightening to watch. Even Kate looks away. We see the mother coming, but Jack does not hear our hissed warnings. Enough, the mother says. The word rattles our skulls in its fury. Jack freezes and stands up. The ichor that pools beneath her is streaked with blood. Jack shakes. The mother will discipline her. Perhaps take her away forever. It has happened before. Look at this mess, the mother says. Kate bursts into sobs. Somehow, the new girl is on her feet. She braces herself against the table. She's bleeding from her lip, from her nose, from a dozen cuts. Her eye is already swelling. Tell me, the mother orders. Tell you what? The new girl asks. Molly gasps. Tell me what she has done, the mother says. And its oily appendage taps Jack on the forehead leaving a further smear on her brow. Jack cowers. We fell, the new girl says. It's nothing. We stare at her, our mouths hanging open. Do not lie to me, girl, the mother says. It is unbecoming. It draws the last word out until it echoes between our ears. Molly claws at the skin on her arms. It was an accident, the new girl says. 
The mother sidles very close to her. It reeks of honey and rotted meat. The new girl is shaking. The new girl does not look away. You must both be corrected, the mother says. Two days later, a mother shoves Belle and Jack back into the dorm. Belle's wounds have not healed. The two girls are holding hands. They remind us of ships that have broken against a reef. They do not meet our eyes. We are very quiet. The clock strikes. The lights burn out. In the darkness, we hear Jack climb into Belle's bed. In moments, they're asleep in one another's arms. In the morning, Belle asks how long it has been. When we tell her, she makes the marks on the wall above her head. Afterwards, she stares at the shard of glass for a long time. Jack stares at her. That night, we are listening for the clock when Belle, perched at the end of her bunk, says, Why do we do what they say? Shut up, new girl, Kate says. You shut up, Jack says, and Kate flinches. Because they will hurt us, Miranda says. Or kill us, Molly says. Because of the things outside. Jack says, very softly. Everyone goes quiet, but it is not yet night, and there are no sounds behind the walls. Death would be better than this, Belle says. Would it? Miranda asks. The clock rings. The lights go out. I think we're already dead, Kate says. I've seen bodies. Miranda says. We can die. Thank God, Belle says. Outside, we think we hear a scraping. It may be the wind in the trees. We listen for a long time. If I have to die, I want to die on my feet, Jack says. I would like that. Her words are an appeal to Belle. There is no answer. Kate cries in her bed. We don't know if it is because she's afraid of death or the mother's or because Belle is no longer the new girl. Molly slips to her bed and whispers in her ear. Get away, Kate hisses. I don't want your help. Molly slinks back to her bed. She's the kindest of us, but that does not mean she did not leave scars. The shower heads are spitting out brown water with the fetid odor of a swamp. We stand outside of the spray, dejected. Miranda is the most dejected because we've been trading days on i duty and yesterday was hers. Good girls must shower, says a mother. It's broken, Kate says, then claps her hands over her mouth. The mother slurps across the scummy tile. What did you say? It's broken, Belle says. We all stare, wondering why she has stepped forward for Kate, who she hates, and wondering if she means to die now. It's broken, and we can't use it, Belle says. Girls must shower, the mother says. When you were wayward, you did not shower, and you were unclean. The water isn't clean, Jack says. She steps up beside Belle. We know she will not survive without Belle. There is a roar behind our eyes. We all stagger. Molly falls to the wet floor, clutching her face. You will be reformed. Or you will suffer. Belle balls her hands into fists. You horror, she says. We won't shower. We won't be your good girls. The pressure in our heads builds. 
Our heads feel like gas-filled corpses ready to burst. One by one, we collapse. When we're lying on the ground, bleeding from our ears, clutching our knees to our chins, the mother speaks. Then you are not worthy of our protection. The pressure breaks. We, we blink and slowly uncurl ourselves. The mother is gone, its ichor mixing with the water, sluicing down the drain. Where did it go? Belle asks, as though this is a trick she has not yet seen. None of us have seen it. Molly? Kate asks. We turn. Molly's open eyes stare at the ceiling. I told you, Miranda says very quietly, and we feel something break in her. After a long silence, Kate insists we bury her. That's what you do, she says. That's what people do when their friends die. I remember that. We look at each other uneasily. We don't say, you weren't friends. We don't say anything. We see no mothers as we take Molly's body to the garden. The house is silent save for the wind, the scraping of trees against the walls. The ground is hard. We dig with our hands, with spoons from the kitchen, with bits of stone. There are many roots and many rocks. Do you think they are really gone? Jack asks. It's a trick, Kate says. They've never gone away before, Miranda says in the small voice. Good riddance, Belle says. No one is protecting us, Miranda says. No one will protect us. From what? Belle asks. But she knows. We all know. The things beyond the walls. The ones that make the noises. We have only dug a couple of feet deep when the clock rings. The lights die. We stumble through the building, clutching each other, moving as fast as we can. The fact that we are not in complete darkness suggests that perhaps somewhere behind many clouds is a sliver of the moon. We find the door to the dorm. It creaks open, echoing down the hallway. We slip inside. No one goes to their bunk alone. Kate curls up with Miranda. We have an even number now. The chuffing wakes us in the middle of the night. We listen, each of us clutching the hands of another. There are heavy breaths and snorts and sounds like forks being scraped across empty plates. The thing on the outside walks back and forth across the base of the wall, and we do not sleep. The sounds only stop when the lamps at night. We listen for a long time, though it is day. Then Miranda cautiously opens the door. There is nothing in the hall. No mothers, nothing from outside. We go to the kitchen and slip behind the counter. We find a thick door. The door turns with a great handle, like a bank vault. This is where they keep the food, Jack says. We'll starve, Kate says. But with effort, we pull the door open, and inside is porridge, great drums of it stacked high. We pry one open, eat it in silence, then go outside and dig again. We make little progress. You've killed us, Miranda says. It will find a way in soon. The mothers kept it out. You don't know that. Belle says. You think the mothers are the worst thing we can fear? Miranda says. They were our protectors. We could beg them to come back, Kate says. They might be listening. Never, Belle says. You just want to die, Kate says. We try not to look at Molly's body. You don't care if you die. The walls are high, Jack says. We can live here, together. She's looking at Belle intently. Don't die, her eyes say. This isn't living, Belle says. For a long time, 
There's only the sound of us digging, and the sniffles as Jack wipes at tears we pretend not to see. When we are three feet deep, we hit a rock, and so we bury Molly there, among the shallow roots and stone. She was kind, Jack whispers. Too kind, Miranda says. Not kind enough, Kate says. We should mark her grave, Miranda says. We plant three sticks in the ground by her head. It is the best we can do. We are back in the dorm room when the clock strikes night. The thing outside doesn't wait. It sniffs, it grunts, it claws at the ground and at the walls. The sounds of its claws are like glass shattering. It stops. We do not dare to breathe. A huff, and the glass breaking sound is far up the outside wall. We scramble from our beds. We hear it leap again, hear the impact even higher, close to the windows far above us. It has our scent. We rush from the room. Behind us, we hear the shattering of the windows, or maybe the claws against concrete. It roars. The sound fills the home like the mother's words filled our minds. We run. The kitchen, Miranda says. The door to the dorms burst open. We rush through the kitchen, Jack leading the way. The porridge, she gasps. The roars of the thing echo. The shattering sounds are close behind us. Jack spins the handle. We pull at the door. Something loud cracks behind us. The door slides open. Go, Miranda says. Huh! A splatter of something wet and warm catches us. Miranda gurgles once and falls to the ground. The thing behind her is a dark geometry, a series of sharp angles with limbs like sabers. It bends down to feed. We get past the door, slam it behind us. We hear the crunching from outside. The door is thick but does not block out enough of the sound. Eventually, we hear a cracking and slurping, a sound like a dog worrying at a bone. Then the claws rake at the door. We clutch our heads and try not to think of Miranda, nor Molly. We sit, shaking, curled amongst one another. The thing from outside does not grow tired. It does not stop seeking entrance. But then suddenly, the sound stops. We hope day has arrived, but we're afraid it may be a trick. We listen for a long time. No one speaks. The door creaks open, and we flinch, but... Kate has opened it. Light spills in. There's nothing waiting for us but a smear of blood. We have to call the mothers back, Kate says. We have to beg them. Do you think they will come back, says Jack. We have to try, Kate says. We have to leave, Belle says. We stare at her. Leave, Jack says. Go outside, where that thing is. That thing is in here now, too, Belle says. Why are you always trying to die, Jack demands. Belle scratches at her arm. Once, she says, back when I could wander, I found a stream, and the bank was thick with mulberries. I ate until my mouth and hands were stained purple. I ate until I was nearly sick. Then I slept in the sun. Don't torture us, Kate says. Please. I can't remember what they tasted like, Belle says. It is better to forget, Jack says. Easier. I don't want to forget. Not ever, Belle says. When you die, you forget everything, Jack says. The silence stretches. Belle reaches into the open drum and scoops out handfuls of porridge. She eats hurriedly. I'm leaving, she says. Climbing the garden wall and leaving. Please don't make me go alone. We think, Belle is right, that 
she may be right. We will go with Belle. We think we will go with her. When we asked Izzy Wasserstein about this story, she said, While writing this story, I was thinking a lot about how many of the worst things we do to one another are done out of a desire to protect and keep safe, and how little surety we have that change will bring about improvement. This story is Izzy's first professional sale, and I have no doubt in my mind that it will be the first of many to come. In this story, she's created the perfect embodiment of a principle of human survival. Things are bad, but we trust that they could be worse. We are unhappy, but it is better than being afraid. We are afraid, but at least we are alive. We are alive, and the cost of living must surely be worth it. What, then, will we do to live? What will we sacrifice, and at what point do we stop living and start surviving? The beast is just outside the walls. It has your scent. And like the ocean pursuing your boat, the beast is always trying to get inside. What will you do to keep it out? Will you let your own spirit be broken? Will you ensure that the spirits of others are broken too, so they don't disrupt the order that keeps the beast away? The most terrifying part of the story Izzy Wasserstein has written is the moral. Sometimes, the sacrifices we make in order to survive are, in fact, necessary. Sometimes the beast really is as bad as we fear, worse even. Sometimes the desire to live, to really truly live, is in direct conflict with the instinct to survive. Sometimes we have to choose. And which will we choose? Which would you choose? Life or survival? While you're considering that choice, you can also consider the choice to help Pseudopod survive. Go to pseudopod.org and click on Feed the Pod to subscribe, and Pseudopod might even outlive all of us. Pseudopod is part of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Theme music is by permission of Anders Manga. And Pseudopod knows it's better to see your cheek grown hollow, better to see your temple worn, than to forget to follow, follow, after the sound of a silver horn. Better to bind your brow with willow and follow, follow, until you die, than to sleep with your head on a golden pillow, nor lift it up when the hunt goes by. Better to see your cheek grow sallow and your hair grown gray so soon, so soon, than to forget to hallow, hallow, after the milk-white hounds of the moon.